on World News Tonight. Surprising swap. A star basketballer in exchange for the merchant of death. Was the trade unconscionable? More on this tonight. Putin perseveres. The Kremlin prepares to annex more territories in Ukraine, putting the blame on Ukraine for striking first. Ringing the knell. Protesters in Iran face the grim reality of the first of potentially many more executions to come. And it's the seasonal best. The Rockets keep kicking it this Christmas with their annual Christmas Spectacular. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We start off tonight with the controversial prisoner swap. Pro basketball star Brittany Griner has made her way home to the U.S. tonight following 10 months in Russian custody. The prisoner swap had the U.S. government releasing in exchange the infamous arms dealer known as the Merchant of Death. The move is not without controversy, however, as the four-year imprisonment anniversary of war veteran Paul Whelan approaches, causing critics in the U.S. to question the Biden administration, prioritizing drug smugglers over war veterans. Tonight, after 10 months behind bars in Russia, WNBA star Brittany Griner is coming home. Seen here on Russian state video. Do you know where I'm heading to? No. No? No. 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 You fly back home. She's safe. She's on a plane. She's on her way home. After months of being unjustly detained in Russia, held under intolerable circumstances, Brittany will soon be back in the arms of her loved ones and, uh, and she should have been there all along. President Biden alongside Griner's wife, Sherelle, after both talked to Brittany from the Oval Office. And so today I'm just standing here um, overwhelmed with emotions, but the most important emotion that I have right now is just sincere gratitude um, for President Biden and his entire administration. Griner was exchanged on the tarmac in the United Arab Emirates for a notorious Russian arms dealer, Victor Boot. Boot also seen on state TV flying back to Russia. He says, they took me right out of my cell. Widely known as the merchant of death, he had served 11 years of a 25-year sentence in the U.S. But he also has deep relations with intelligence officers. And don't forget, Vladimir Putin is an intelligence officer. Griner's family said she was dejected after losing her final appeal in October. This has been a very traumatic um, experience waiting for this day. And spending the last month in a harsh penal colony. Now she's en route to a military hospital in San Antonio where she will be reunited with her wife. Her teammates are already celebrating, but left behind another American the U.S. says is wrongfully detained in Russia. Businessman and former Marine Paul Whelan, who's already served four years of a 16-year sentence, charged with spying, which the U.S. strongly denies. Whelan speaking from prison to CNN. I don't understand why I'm still sitting here. Hey, I'm greatly disappointed that more has not been done to secure my release, especially as the four-year anniversary of my arrest is coming up. The president says they will never give up trying to get Whelan home. What do you say to the Whelan family who says this is a catastrophe for Paul, Mr. President? We're speaking to that. How soon will he be home? The U.S. says Russia demanded the U.S. return one of their spies, but the U.S. says it has none in custody to trade. Meanwhile, the Kremlin is insisting that there is much work to be done in terms of liberation of the annexed territories behind Ukrainian borders. President Putin insists that the country will continue to target key energy infrastructure, claiming Ukraine pulled the trigger first. The Kremlin has admitted there's a lot of work ahead, saying Russia still needs to liberate parts of Ukraine it claims to be its own. This says President Vladimir Putin hands out awards to military personnel. There he vowed to continue attacking Ukraine's energy infrastructure, despite millions being left without electricity or water. There has been much noise about our strikes on the neighboring country's energy infrastructure. Yes, we are doing it. But who started it all? who targeted the Crimean bridge. At least 10 people have been killed by Russian strikes in Kirkov city. Ukraine's president says a market, a lift, a petrol station and bus station were targeted. The government says Russian shelling in the eastern Donetsk region has significantly intensified, with some 20 towns and villages under constant attack. 
Now, with the war in Ukraine causing economic strain in Europe, the EU is also now recognizing the serious underinvestment done when it comes to military forces in the bloc as the conflict draws longer, causing serious depletion of strategic military resources. The EU has sent billions in arms and equipment to Ukraine in an operation unprecedented since the founding of the Union. But this has also exposed the fact that artillery stock between the 27 member states is strained and undersupplied. The head of EU diplomacy, Josep Borrell, called on European countries to reverse this trend. This war against Ukraine has been a brutal wake up for many of us, for all of us. It certainly has been a wake up. We realize that our military stockpiles have been quickly depleted due to years of underinvestment. May I say that? I know public opinion prefer butter to cannons, certainly, but for years we have been under investment. European countries remain highly dependent on the US and NATO. As such, Russia's invasion in Ukraine has seen a growing number of U.S. troops being deployed into Europe to ward off a potential threat from Moscow. Countries such as France want European defense to be increasingly integrated, a trend that is gathering momentum. Iran has carried out its first known execution over the protests that have shaken the regime since September, hanging a 23-year-old man after a legal process denounced as a show trial by rights groups. At least a dozen other people are currently at risk of imminent execution after being sentenced to hang over the protests in recent weeks, human rights groups have warned. It was a dispatch from the Iranian press agency that revealed the news. For the first time, Iran has executed a protester who took part in the popular uprising, that has shaken the country for almost three months. The protests that erupted in mid-September after the death of young Masa Amini represent one of the greatest challenges facing the Islamic Republic since its establishment in 1979. At least 475 protesters have so far been killed, according to the Human Rights Activists News Agency. On est un peu décalé, on est un peu tous des zombies. We go to bed thinking, great, there are lots of people in the street who are protesting. Then we wake up to learn there's an execution and that a commander of the Revolutionary Guards announces that he will now no longer hold back. On Monday, the powerful Revolutionary Guards also encouraged justice to be firm against all those who are accused of crimes against the security of the nation. According to Amnesty International, more than 20 people are currently facing the death penalty for participating in the process. From president to prisoner, Peru's ex-president Pedro Castillo is now facing accusations of plotting rebellion and is being detained for a week in preliminary jailing following his fall from power. Peru's ousted former president, Pedro Castillo, was ordered a seven-day preliminary jail sentence on Thursday, a day after he was arrested and criminally charged with rebellion and conspiracy. The widely unpopular leader's swift fall from power came after congressional lawmakers voted overwhelmingly to remove him. After Castillo tried to dissolve Congress illegally in a bid to stay in office and avoid a third impeachment vote. His downfall follows months of instability and multiple corruption scandals. On the day of his arrest, supporters of Castillo clashed with riot police in Lima, while others took to the streets to celebrate the ex-leader's ousting. On Thursday, his supporters protested outside the prison where he was being held. Castillo's lawyer rejected the rebellion charge, arguing that such an act implies use of weapons and violence, which he said never occurred. Prosecutor said he should be behind bars. It is to be noted that if freed, Mr. Castillo could communicate with government officials to hide or destroy elements of conviction that prevent the investigation of the truth. Meanwhile, Castillo's successor and former vice president, Dina Boluarte, issued her first pronouncements at the presidential palace a day after being sworn in as Peru's first female president. I think that the assumption of the presidency at this time is a bit of a reorientation of what needs to be done with the country. Later on, in coordination with all the organizations, we will be looking at alternatives to better reorient the destiny of the country. 
Buluarte may ultimately have to call for early elections to bring stability to a country that has been mired in political turmoil for years. The new president said calling early elections would be democratically respectable, but added she wants to hold additional discussions first without adding further details. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. The triple demic continues to be a growing cause for concern in the U.S. as hospitalization rates soar, putting mounting pressures on already fraying healthcare system. At Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, on weekdays, the ER is usually at or near capacity. For the past month, the Mass General Brigham system has seen flu cases jump by more than 1,100 percent. Across the country, the CDC says flu hospitalizations this season are up to 78,000. We have not yet seen a reprieve. Cases and hospitalizations are continuing to go up. At Mass General for Children, RSV cases have leveled off, but... We've never had this amount of patients this sick for an extended period of time. Georgia Orlowski's five-year-old son, Jack, who has a rare genetic disorder, has been sick with COVID, RSV, and the flu all within the past month. There is also a shortage of the pediatric medication albuterol, so workers here are compounding their own. A painstaking but necessary process as the triple-demic takes hold. If a patient can't breathe and we can't give them this drug, uh, then it's a life or death scenario. Now, the migrant crisis is continuing to affect most countries across the globe, from the U.S. now in Europe, as a human trafficking ring has been discovered by Europol across the Belarusian border, which attempted to force migrants through the region illegally. Police in Poland, Estonia, Germany, Lithuania and Latvia, coordinated by Europol, have arrested several members of a human smuggling ring using the Belarusian border to smuggle migrants into Europe. Polish police have reinforced the border with Belarus to prevent mass illegal entries. The network used Turkey at the start of the journey. From there, the migrants were sent to Moscow by plane. From the Russian capital, they were sent to Belarus. Once across the border into the EU, the network used clandestine transports to get them to Germany, the final destination. The M23 rebel group has reportedly carried out a massacre, killing over 120 people so far in retaliation for clashes between revival arms groups. The UN has claimed that further investigation may result in more such findings. The United Nations said on Thursday that the M23 armed group executed at least 131 villagers in reprisal killings in East Democratic Republic of Congo late last month as part of a campaign of murder, rape, kidnapping and looting. A preliminary investigation was done by the UN Peacekeeping Mission and the Joint Human Rights Office into the November 29th to 30th massacres in the villages of Kishishe and Bambo. It has found that killings were undertaken in retaliation for clashes between M23 and rival armed groups. Investigators interviewed 52 victims and direct witnesses and various other sources in Rwindi about 12 miles from Kishishe, where survivors and witnesses had taken refuge, the UN said. The government has accused M23 of killing as many as 272 people. The militia, which has captured several towns near the borders of Rwanda and Uganda this year, has denied responsibility and asked for a full investigation. M23's recent offensives have uprooted thousands of civilians and sparked a diplomatic spat with neighboring Rwanda. Congo and UN experts accuse Rwanda of backing the militia. Rwanda denies any involvement. Now, Uganda is holding on to hope in the fighting against a deadly Ebola outbreak that has caused extensive damage recently. A clinical trial will soon take place with the new vaccine trial candidates that have been shipped to the country. Health authorities in Uganda said on Thursday a shipment of 1,200 doses of Ebola vaccine candidates have arrived in the country. They are said to be used in a clinical trial. The Ebola outbreak in Uganda has infected 142 people and killed at least 56, according to authorities. 
Last week, the country said it had discharged its last Ebola patient from hospital, raising hopes of an end to an outbreak declared on September 20th. The World Health Organization said it would send three vaccine candidates to Uganda to be used in the trial, one by the University of Oxford and Serum Institute of India, another by the Sabine Vaccine Institute and a third by Merck. There are currently no licensed vaccines for the Sudan strain of the virus that caused the infections in Uganda. The trial is to determine whether any or all of the three are effective in combating the strain. Existing vaccines combat the more common Zaire strain, which spread during recent outbreaks in neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. Uganda is counting down to its 42 straight days without any new Ebola cases reported. When that period ends on January 10th, it will be declared Ebola-free. But even if that milestone is hit, the vaccine trial will continue, the country's health minister said. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The construction of an improvised border wall along Arizona's U.S.-Mexico border made from hundreds of shipping containers continues despite an ongoing legal battle between the governor and the Biden administration. German police are investigating a plot to overturn their country's government that included a large amount of money and weapons. Police detained 25 people for being part of Germany's Right Citizens Movement. The former chief executive of financial services company Wirecard and two other ex-managers went on trial over the firm's collapse in what has been described as the biggest case of fraud in post-war Germany. Sculptor Veronica Ryan has been named the winner of this year's Visual Arts Turner Prize. Ryan was recognized for her work, which includes an exploration of the COVID pandemic and Windrush generation. Lisbon is on high alert after heavy rains caused flooding in buildings and tunnels, swept away cars and killed at least one person. In the Lisbon metropolitan area, a 55-year-old woman was found dead in the flooded basement of the building where she lived. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with views of Radio City's Rockettes getting back in action with their vibrant flair and their iconic high kicks yet again this Christmas season, just in time for their annual Christmas Spectacular show in Radio City Music Hall. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.